rancher in southeast Arizona, Cochise County. We raise Navajo churro sheep and Raramuri Criollo cattle. My grandfather had a friend who was a rancher in Colorado. Uh, his name was John E. Rouse. And uh, he had written a, a three-part book series called World Cattle and then wrote a fourth volume titled Criollo Cattle of the Americas. And I got a copy of that book and I was fascinated by the fact that there were Criollo cattle in every country from the tip of South America all the way to Canada. And um, so some years later, a friend of mine named Ed Fredrickson, a research animal scientist at the Hornada Experimental Range in Las Cruces, New Mexico, uh, told me about a project uh, that he was working on. I, I ran into him at a Society for Range Management meeting in Denver, and he said he'd just come back from Mexico and he'd been down in the in the Copper Canyon, the Bar Barranca de Cobre, with the Tarahumara Indians, um, looking at Criollo cattle with the idea that if the genetic testing worked, they would be importing these cattle and starting a breeding herd on the Hornada to conduct experiments related to their ability to adjust to prolonged drought and climate change. And I said, man, when you have enough of these cattle to sell some, I'm interested. I, this sounds amazing. Because, of course, by then, it was the early 2000s, maybe 2002 or three, something like that, um, we were already experiencing periodic long droughts and changes in the climate cycle and so forth. And um, trying to look at what best way that we could match the genetics of the cattle to the reality of the landscape that we work in. And that was my, my big interest in Criollo. I had no idea at the time that the meat quality was as good as it is. I just thought they would make a great cow breed and, you know, be more efficient utilizers of the landscape. We're doing some research on Deb and Dennis Moroni's ranch in Cochise County, southeastern Arizona. We are looking at grazing behavior, diet selection, and meat characteristics of ranch-fed Raramuri Criollo cows, heifers, and steers during each season. They have a long life. They're fertile cattle. They're well adapted to our landscape in that they eat a broad range of plants. They're not just grazers, not just grass utilizers, but they utilize a lot of the shrubs and trees that grow on the ranch. In addition, they, um, they forage on prickly pear cactus during the winter, mesquite beans and, and mesquite uh, flowers during the spring. The cattle are able to adapt their diet according to what's available, what kind of forage is available. They move across the landscape, travel quite extensively during the day. Um, they have hard, tough feet. They don't get sore-footed grazing up in the mountains. They have big horns and the big horns give them the ability to resist predators. Uh, they can take a coyote and hook them and throw them through the air. Uh, they tend to circle up and face outward when they're confronted with predators. I think this is going to be a factor that may, may, be, may make a big difference for us um, should we ultimately be experiencing reintroduced wolves in our area. It seems that that's likely in the future. Um, in addition, they really never get sick. Um, we have um, had absolutely excellent carcass results from them. Um, we're slaughtering finished cattle that way 
1,100 pounds, 1,150 pounds. They marble exceptionally well. They're very tender. Um, we've been doing Warner Bratzler sheer force testing for several years now. We tested over 100 animals from the 47 ranch and they all tasted very tender. To do the tenderness test with the Warner Bratzler sheer force machine, you have to take a ribeye. First, you cook it for roughly 10 minutes in order to reach an internal temperature of 160 degrees Fahrenheit. Second, the ribeye has to cool down to room temperature to reach 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Then you get samples from the cooked ribeye that we call cores. These cores are going to be the meat that you use to test the tenderness. When you have these cores, you're ready to use the machine. In this video, you can see that the machine is going down and is cutting the piece of meat. When the meat is cut, it gives you a reading of the pressure needed to cut the meat. This number is your tenderness result. According to the USDA standards, the lower the grade is, the more tender the meat is. If the tenderness is under 8.6, it is considered very tender. If the tenderness is between 8.6 and 9.7, it is tender. For 100 animals from the 47 ranch, we have an average tenderness of 5.8. This result really shows the potential of the Criollo cattle to produce very tender meat. But do we know if it's due to genetics or environmental causes? We don't know that yet for sure. Uh, because for instance, Deb and Dennis are making sure to use low stress handling method with your cattle, which helps the meat to be tender. Because if you have a animal which is under stress conditions, the meat is going to be affected by that. The flavor is excellent. They're just a very unique breed. Uh, and the nice thing is, there's really never been much selection for color. So presently, we have every color pattern and every solid color imaginable. And for a guy like me, um, it helps me remember individual animals and individual um, traits of particular animals because of their physical differences. Some people can remember ear tag numbers, but I'm not one of those. As far as the cons of raising these cattle, I think you have to overcome a certain amount of prejudice. The market clearly favors a solid black old animal, preferably one with Angus genetics. Um, these animals have horns. They're probably not going to ever be well accepted in feedlot situations or crowded uh, conditions. They're a much better animal for free-ranging large open landscapes. Uh, they do adapt well to pasture rotation regimes. They're very smart, so they understand what's going on and they pretty quickly group up, line out and, and go because they know the next pasture will be fresh feed. But I would say that the, that having horns and multicolored um, would be drawbacks for people that are interested in primarily in marketing into the existing commercial market. But the flip side is the world is changing and with the reintroduction of predators such as wolves, grizzlies, uh, maybe jaguars, I think these animals are going to be very effective at holding their own. We know people in Venezuela, Brazil and Colombia are using them 
as guard cattle. And we have recently sold some of these cattle to a rancher in Florida who's in the area where the Florida panther is being recovered and they've experienced significant predation losses and they're hoping that Rarimori Criollo will work for them as guard cattle. The only other disadvantages that I can think of are that uh, they do like to move around and if they find a place to get around a natural barrier, uh, I don't think they ever understood the definition of natural barrier. They, they climb rock walls like goats and they'll go where the feed is best. And that means that cowboys work a little harder to keep tabs on them. It makes for good horses and good cowboys, but you know, um, it's a small price to pay. One conclusion that we can draw from our study right now is that the Criollo cattle from the 47 Ranch are night grazers. They spend time near water between 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. and then they go out and graze. I think probably the biggest challenge is, challenge that I've had, you know, the most um, uh, concentration on has been marketing the animals. The marketing for us has been uh, primarily as all natural grass fed meat. So they're going to customers who are more health conscious. Um, I think they're an excellent animal for that market. And I think that market is still emerging. We've been um, opening the doors to some institutional customers, um, hospitals in particular, who are concerned about animals that are raised antibiotic free and hormone free. Um, I think other challenges would be um, the fact that the meat quality to get a finished animal 1100 pounds takes a little bit longer than it does uh, with a feedlot finished animal. I think that you can find a lot of examples of animals going to slaughter from a feedlot at 14 or 15 months of age. Uh, we typically slaughter 28 to 32 months of age and anything over 30 months because of um, mad cow uh, restrictions, we cannot cut T-bones or porterhouse steak. That really hasn't hurt our market because we offer New York's and boneless ribeyes and um, bone-in rib steaks. Most of our customers, they're good with that. We do uh, fairly often have animals that can go to slaughter at under 30 months. Um, we also have experimented with um, solid colored pulled sires crossed on Criollo cows, producing solid colored pulled calves that may finish, you know, a little bit earlier. And uh, so that's worked out well as well. We'll be doing more of that in the future. Um, otherwise, just the kind of, uh, I guess, natural, I don't know if it's natural, but there's a certain amount of bias against these cattle because they've been associated through appearance with the uh, Corriente cattle that are most often used for rodeo cattle and are really popular in our area for that purpose. And people see them driving by on the road and they think, oh, that's more Corriente cattle. And they don't realize that the, the steers have the genetic potential to actually achieve the size that they do. And that as a meat animal, they are quite different from the selection pressure that was placed on Corriente. I wish that I had known more about them earlier and had access to a source for them. I think they're, they're excellent cattle. And of course, um, 
For ranchers, shopping for genetics is always, um, it's always interesting, but also challenging and a little bit, uh, a little bit risky because um, you don't really know how these animals will perform until you have them on your own ranch, interacting with the environment that you ranch in and going into the markets that you're familiar with. Um, I've been absolutely, totally satisfied with the way these cattle have performed for us on our ranch. We're, we're operating between 4,000 and 6,500 feet in what would be considered uh, desert grassland. We're in a 12 to 16 inch rainfall area in the lower country and 16 to 20 inch rainfall in the mountains. And uh, they, just, they just do really, really well. And uh, they're gentle cattle. They have a calm disposition. They um, are really, I don't know, they're a beautiful animal. You know, I see them out on the landscape. They've got some pretty, pretty colors and spots and um, incredible, incredible horns. And uh, those horns are a pain in the butt to take you know, put an animal through the squeeze chute. But it's interesting how they learn to maneuver through the chute and we can do everything that we need to do with them the same way everybody else does. We just have to be a little bit more skilled. And so um, I think the downside is far outweighed by the benefits. The only other thing I didn't mention is that the calves are born with an exceptionally low birth weight. I mean, they're like 35, 40 pound calves. They look like a, about the size of a, maybe a medium sized border collie with slick hair. So it's pretty neat. They plop out and then to realize that in two and a half years, you're gonna have an animal that weighs over 1100 pounds and tastes fabulous. What more could you want in the beef business? Mm -hmm.